Okay, so I've caught briefly uh, Phil Radford, who is the outgoing executive director of Greenpeace USA after, was it 10, 10 years? Something 10 like that. years with Greenpeace, five years as executive director. The Arctic 30 was a perfect example of the contagious courage of Greenpeace. Um, for example, in Russia, the Russian government was putting so much pressure on our office. There were masked men that jumped over the fence and raided part of the office. Um, There's a lot of concern that people would be arbitrarily arrested during all of it. And parents were calling all of our staff there and saying, you should quit. And none of them quit, which was just amazing. You know, the courage of um, Peter Wilcox, the captain of the Arctic Sunrise, who also was the captain of the Rainbow Warrior when that was sunk. Um, he He's just an unbelievable inspiration. He stayed strong for the two months that he and 29 other people were in jail and came out while still in Russia saying, this is unjustified that we're imprisoned. This is unbelievable. You know, and basically saying that the Russian government was really afraid because we threatened what they thought was their future, which is extraction for oil and gas. And he was out there saying, no, we actually see a different future that everyone can have, which is clean energy, much more prosperity, and not needing to destroy the environment for future generations. Does it seem, is Russia, I wouldn't say unique, but special in, in some dark way? Like even in China, there's been this remarkable shift on some things like a uh, ivory and um, uh, shark fins, much of which was built through social pressure. But in Russia, that still doesn't seem to work. Is it, what, what is it, what, what makes it different? Or do you see that as not a good di dichotomy there? You know, I think that a big reason that the USSR fell apart was oil prices dropped. And if you just don't have all that revenue in the state to hold the country together, then things can really slip. So any leader of Russia, I think the lesson, one lesson taken from that was, don't lose oil and natural gas revenue. That's what holds the country together. And I think the, the Russian government has moved on energy efficiency. Our office there has done quite a bit of great work there, uh, moved some on conservation. But when it comes to oil and gas, uh, the state owns those assets and the state makes its money from those. And that's how the state keeps control. So it's not so much a nation to nation question as uh, whatever the some commodities or some resources are just too uh, hardcore to, for them to sort of soften on. I think so, yeah. Then another was Asia, Asia and Pulp and Paper, you know, and I credited Greenpeace for, um, y you know, essentially environmentalism has a whole span from monkey wrenching to uh, the sort of stodgy green groups uh, that are heavy, heavy on lawyers um, who are there in the middle to catch the companies when they come falling or crying for help after the edge pushers have done their thing. And I credited that whole matrix in, uh, in Asia with Pulp and, and um, and Greenpeace's role, and also with palm with palm oil uh, was another example. Um, would you say is that a new was that a shift for for Greenpeace, or is that just the grand tradition of working there? Well, Greenpeace has worked to influence companies to take principled stands for a long time. Um, so this example you're talking about. Um, Greenpeace was able to work with other groups to cut 80% of Asia Pulp and Paper's U.S. market. And then our office in Indonesia was able to negotiate with Asia Pulp and Paper to say, we need you to agree with us to stopping all deforestation and then lobbying for laws with us. Um, you know, after the climate bill in the U.S., we stepped back and said, let's do more of that. And the reason was the climate bill in the U.S. really started with a negotiation between a few environmental groups and a few companies where the environmental groups had very little leverage in the negotiations. And the companies were able to weaken the bill so much that by the time a draft was released in the House, uh, it just looked so weak and everyone knows things get worse as they go through Congress that it, it just didn't have a chance of being a principled solution. And so we took a different approach and we said, let's start to go after the folks that have the power, which unfortunately is companies, and let's give uh, put enough pressure on them, sometimes giving them a near-death experience, like cutting 80% of APP's market in the U.S., until they say, okay, we'll agree with you for a completely principled pro-environment solution because that's better than you being on our tail. And now we have Asia Pulp and Paper working with us to pass a law to make all their competitors do the same in Indonesia. Now, would, would any of this been, have been possible 10 years earlier, given uh, the growth of social media and the ability to use uh, YouTube in a clever way, that kind of thing? Uh, I mean, my thesis is no, that, that um, you know, I talk about what I call the noosphere, this, the ability for, for a group like Greenpeace, uh, given the transparency that's possible, with remote sensing and people on the ground, and then getting that information out and around with creative uh, campaigns, 
is unparalleled in that ability, sort of, especially with globalization of commodities, you know, paper, um, uh, Kit Kat bars in another, in another context, that you can really kind of do things in, in a hurry and in a different way than had been done before. Am I, is, am I making this up or does this seem real? I think it I think it accelerates the rate at which we can get the word out and at the same time in 2000 we ran a really fun campaign against Coca-Cola um they were using refrigerants that cause global warming and so we had a video with a little bear and a baby cub and they because someone was using Coca-Cola and these refrigerants were being released the ice cracked and they were separated um, we used wrote climate change in Coca-Cola's font, and those stickers appeared all over Coke machines all over the world. Um, so that spread really quickly. And the next thing you know, when I on my second week, I think, working at Greenpeace, um, I was on a phone call with the CEO of Coke, where the CEO was announcing that they were putting fifty million dollars into new climate-friendly refrigerants. So, so, uh, so it's kind of like facilitation of a of a tactic that had already shown success in the old media way. Yes. Sometimes I've criticized some Greenpeace actions, uh, like the raid on the Australian GMO um, research crop. Um, I'm not sure how much Greenpeace USA gets; it has a say in that, or whether you have a sense of um, is there a shifting landscape? Is there any? Are there some of these hard edges, like no GMOs, no nukes, are any of these things shifting for the organization, either U.S. or generally, or or is it still seen as hard lines in the sand, that kind of thing? Yeah, I think there's still bright lines in the sand. You know, I agreed with your critique. Greenpeace US uh, was not managing that event in Australia, but there's been a lot of discussion inside Greenpeace. And in that instance, some of the crops were destroyed, and that's just not in alignment with our roots, which are Quaker roots of no property damage, no violence whatsoever. So I think that was a that was kind of a pimple on our otherwise fairly solid history of making sure we live up to those values and holding ourselves accountable to that. But I do think if you look at things like nuclear energy, uh, you know, our position is still the same in just in that it's one of the most expensive and dangerous ways to boil water in the world. And it, you don't have to listen to Greenpeace anymore about nuclear. You can listen to, I don't know, the Wall Street Journal or Fortune or Wall Street who are just saying, look, nuclear energy is a waste of money. It's a huge risk. If the government weren't taking a lot of the risk, no one would have looked at it. Um, and there are just so many problems with doing it safely that when you have solar and wind dropping in price really quickly and storage coming online, it just doesn't seem that we need it. And it's not, you know, it takes 10 years to build a new plant. So that would be too little too late. But uh, looking, you know, climate is something I've been looking at since the 80s. And mm -hmm. when, you, when you take one of these things off the table, like nuclear, um, it becomes more challenging to see uh, trajectories for emissions. Even not, I'm not saying that nuclear would be a big wedge. I don't think we can see either. Nuclear and renewables both face these big hurdles. Um, but taking it off the table entirely seems tough. Even Jim Hansen and others, of course, have started to make um, this case. Uh, and then, of course, when you add in the the mortality, the known uh, pollution costs from coal, and you say, well, you know, like in New York State where I live, if you turn off Indian Point, um, you can't get renewables up fast enough to supplant the need to burn more coal, perhaps. Uh, so it's like, you know, there's, there's again, I'm kind of a reality-based overview person on things like greenhouse gases, and it gets to be a tough question for me on, on something like nuclear to say, no, you know, literally no nukes, as opposed to some nukes. But of course, you can't build a movement around some nukes. <laughs> <laughs> some nukes now. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. I mean, I think, and I think, you know, we we tend to be reality based as well. But then say we have to get to where we can go as quickly as possible. And there are great studies. There's just a study put out by Mark Jacobson, who runs right. Stanford's energy program, and it basically showed how New York State can get to 100% clean energy, no nukes, etc., in the next several decades. And yes, there might be some nuclear plants that are open during the transition. I think the question is, do we need more? It just doesn't seem cost effective. And then the next question is, how quickly can we phase out the most dangerous sources like coal and nuclear while we build a clean energy future? And a lot of that revolves back theoretically to politics. Can you build the political will sufficient in a country like America or in a country like China where energy, well, in the United States, cheap energy is still something people seem to demand is like a fundamental right. <laughs> and and in China, access to energy trumps um, climate concerns. You know, can you have a political will to have a costlier path to either maintaining the status quo in the United States or 
or getting people um, out of poverty, the many, you know, the hundreds of millions who are still in poverty in China. It's like, these are tough questions, but can, you know, and the political action is, is important, you know, like with Keystone, um, but uh, you wonder whether it has limits. There's some who say that uh, making energy more expensive is a tough thing to do with, polit with sort of a political prod. I think that's right. It's easier for utilities to make energy expensive than it is yeah. for advocates to do that, right? Because the history <laughs> of most point. utilities is that they just jack up rates every year, and then they say, oh, other things would be more expensive. Um, I think the truth is that the market is on our side on clean energy. As you know, like Warren Buffett, for example, who owns Mid-American Power, a huge utility, yeah. said that his investments now are wind and solar. So a lot of it's regional, of course, but the prices, as you know, are dropping so quickly for clean energy. And storage is coming online, so you no, no longer have to worry about whether or not the sun is shining. And so I think the good news is that cleaner is increasingly cheaper in more and more of the United States and in more and more of the developing world where it's cheaper to put up solar with storage than to build a whole electricity grid. Yeah. And so I think, um, I think in 10 years, years, we'll look back at this debate, and it'll largely be over. And solar and wind will be the cheapest version. Folks that have invested in 30-year uh, investments in new gas plants or new nuclear plants will regret it because they'll be disrupted by competitive clean energy, and it'll be a whole new day. So I think there's a lot of this debate now, but it's about to change just because of the market. And you know, to your point about political action, once the cost of doing the right thing goes down in terms of clean energy being cheaper, and as we continue to work to make the political cost higher for not doing the right thing, at some point I think things will tip, and it will tip quickly. I, I think you're right about that, and it's it's always kind of a combination. One other thing is whales. You know, you guys were early adopters of the get in their path uh, approach to um, whale vigilance in parts of the world where no one else is there. You know, like the New York Times could never have a ship in the South Southern Ocean, right? Tailing uh, the Japanese, and even Australia, you know, could do what it can. But but uh, Greenpeace, and then of course uh, others, um, including Paul Watson's crew, um, took that on as a task and do you think that that's helped is has that been a how would you cast that as one of your um, you know something that happened in your time you know we um we and started before pull, yeah before my time i mean that was one of the things that really put greenpeace on the map was the few people courageous enough to be in the way of a grenade tipped harpoon going at a whale um over over the last few years we've really shifted our strategy on whaling one of the highlights was President Obama was going to the International Whaling Commission and planning to start to allow quotas of killing whales in that treaty that's banned commercial whaling. And so we worked with several other groups to put pressure on the president. I met with him on Earth Day. I walked up to him and said, Mr. President, you know, I'm concerned about your stance on whales right now. And he said, I know. I've seen your ads. And I said, great. Wow. <laughs> you know, what, what is your plan to change? And he smiled and he said look, I love whales. And I thought, he was, he's just a very charming person, as you know. Right. And uh, so I thought, you can't charm your way out of this. So I held onto his hand a little longer and said, great, what's your plan, sir? And he said, I'll do everything I can. And the next week, they reversed their position. So a lot of this now is um, just continuing to keep champions like the U.S. government champions. Um, in Japan, a lot of the politicians um, really resist Westerners saying stop whaling. Right. And in part, that's because, as you know, um, MacArthur, after World War II, said you can use your Navy ships, but for whaling, to feed all the people that are starving. Right. And so for Westerners to say stop has been, I think sometimes, I, th I think we determined that being in the Southern Ocean has at times been more counterproductive than productive. So we've taken a more political strategy and then also ran campaigns to stop every corporation that does whaling for the government of Japan from doing it anymore. So we've done that as well. So um, I think on Friday I'm supposed to be on a panel charting um, at the Wilson Center charting um, environmental issues that will be the top ones later in this year. And I don't know if you already have your list for what's coming or looking ripe, ripest. I'll mention it. That's a great question. I think fracking. I think uh, obviously climate change with the carbon standards that the, Ob the Obama administration is pushing. And I think there will increasingly be more and more resistance to extraction, whether in shipping. So it, whether it's exporting liquid natural gas, the continued regional fights against coal exports, anything to transport fossil fuels because the president is doing this all of the below 
or you know everything below the ground strategy, which the Cato Institute calls no lobbyists left behind. Yeah. Um, because of that, there will be more and more resistance from actually exporting it and getting it to markets. Well, I wish you luck with whatever is coming next for you. Uh, you're going to get outside the Beltway, do you think? Or I think so. It's up to my wife. She stayed here for me, and so now I follow uh, her. All right. Yep. Well, it's a it's a whole wide world. It's been great to talk with you, Phil, and good luck um, in your next ventures, wherever they may lead you. Thanks, Andy. Take care. You too.